Yeah, thanks, Brian. And for the, I think we've sort of worked out this is probably the best spot. But if you want to even bring your chairs up, up the front there, and want to be more like a yarn and rather than a, a presentation, I think I'd never, you know, talking to my elders and um, my community, I never think of it like that. I think it's more like a, a yarn. Um, yeah, I'm Ron Murray, and, and I live up in in Castlemaine. I've got Sarah, um, my wife. Sarah, she's uh, of, born here, but of Scottish descent, and uh, we play music professionally together. Uh, we've got a duo called Kenja. I didn't bring me CDs, actually. Um, but Sarah plays beautiful violin, and, and we do a, 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 like folk music, I suppose, and we, we, we get booked probably once, once a week. Um, you never know, and all sorts of functions, but mainly corporate we do, because um, that's, that's where the money is. Um, and, the, and, the, and a lot of the corporate functions are, have got a budget and um, Sarah does all of our booking, which is great, so it's all in-house. Um, we've got two little boys, uh, Louis five and, um, and Brody's uh, 13. Uh, Brody's just got a, uh, we're going for a big life change at home at the moment, he's 13, he's just got a scholarship at Geelong Grammar which, you know, um, there's 25 young Indigenous people there on Yalari scholarships, but he didn't get in through that. He got in, uh, the school actually sort of came after him a bit because um, I work for them and I, I do NADOC every year up at uh, a place called Timbertop. That's where Prince Charles went. And it's a very elitist school, it, it, it is, it, no doubt about that. Um, so he's just started, so we've only got this one little, little five-year-old in the house and. So Sarah, I haven't seen her for about oh, a fortnight. She's been sleeping in his bed and crying and, you know, <laughs> sleeping with his dirty tracksuit pants and, <laughs> and I've got no one, you know, but yeah. So yeah, he, he's, he's a, a good kid. Um, he's a brilliant tennis player. You know, he's in the, in the top 30 in his age group in Australia. He's had three scholarships through Tennis Australia, just, which is great because you don't know, choose and rackets and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, that's um, and we live in a, a, on 40 acres outside Castle Main. We build a um, recycled house. So that's been up there for about 13 years. But uh, I just want to acknowledge too that we are on, on the, the lands of the Kurnai Gunai. Um, I, I I used to come down here. Gee, only Janet. How many years did we work it out? 15 more, 20. Yeah, where I'm at, um, only Janet. 20 years ago when I was with um, the Aboriginal Community Justice Panelist Unit, unit inside uh, Victoria Police and um, so that was great because in that role I, I did get this side of Melbourne met beautiful elders like Aunty Rita and Uncle Kevin um, which I hope I'll go and see Aunty Rita tomorrow whether she remembers me or not um, uh, Uncle Albert you know and, and Aunty Doris and, and you know people like that I, I met really the I suppose these amazing elders right from one end of Victoria to the other. So I had to travel then down towards Haywood uh, that way. But I, I did six years before that, uh, before I was, while I was at, at, the, at the CJP, I ended up um, getting the Aboriginal advisors role to Victoria Police. So I had six years there, I did all the training at the academy to all the, all the um, recruits. And before that I did six years with um, the Aboriginal Legal Service. And I started off up in Swan Hill. And when I went for the job, I thought, you know, I'm an expert. I thought I was. Um, a fortnight into the job, I had a, a lady in the, in the office, uh, you know, with a complaint that her two children were getting sexually abused by her father-in-law. You know, I knew nothing. You know, I thought I did. So that was all new. But um, while I was at Swan Hill, I, I walked out of a flat and witnessed two brothers fighting and where one brother stabbed his other brother down here and killed him. And you know, you, I was looking at some of the Brian, your your, your things you're going to cover in your in your um, in your workshops. Uh, I just thought I might mention that because at that time when I when that happened to me, I didn't have any support from head office because head office was going through turmoil. The uh, um, Indian bookkeeper had just took off back to Fiji with three hundred fifty thousand dollars of the legal service money. 
Um, the CEO was in the process of getting sacked and the board were being looked at and we were, PricewaterhouseCooper was in there. So when you've got an organisation that's in turmoil, there was no support. I didn't even get a phone call to say, Ron, how are you going? You know, I just, you know, seen your report that you witnessed a murder or, um, you know, and it, was, it was terrible. He, he was on the ground, um, blood coming out of him. I ended up um, doing CPR on him. And the police turned up and the first thing they wanted to do was shoot the other brother. So I was jumping in and around and trying to stop him from shooting him. And it was, it was terrible. And it did affect me, there's no doubt. I, I reckon I, I've never been got diagnosed, I think, but I reckon I've got anxiety because uh, I do panic a little bit when I hear um, certain sort of stories. I get a shallow breathing. Um, uh, and I did go and see a, a psychiatrist over that. When I got to Melbourne, one of the solicitors read, my, read a report and she said, did you ever see anyone about this? And I said, no. And she said, I'm going to book you in to see someone. Um, and I did, I went and seen the psychiatrist, told her the whole story, and next minute I end up with a cheque for 12 grand from Crimes Comp. Um, didn't even know, you know, like, but she, she did say, but it did help, it did, it, it helped. She, she, she said things like, um, you know, what's your favourite music? I said, oh, Roy Orbison. She said, how long since you've heard him? Oh, years. You've got it, you know, all these little things. So I did work it out. I'd, I'd thought about my life and I thought, well, if no one else cares, or, 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 you know, me, me work didn't support me, well, I need to support myself. And that's the biggest thing I could say for you guys and in, in working in, you really got to look around your, your organisation and look, you, 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 we all know each other. And when there's odd things going on, um, we need to be on the ball um, and say, look, yeah, go to the CEO yourself and say, look, I think Auntie uh, so-and-so, you know, she might need a bit of time off or, and I think we do it better now on in the organisations, yeah. So that's, um, I come from a little place called Ballranald and I, and I grew up on a, a massive big sheep and cattle station. Um, and about six years ago, it was, a, it was the biggest freehold station in the Southern Hemisphere. I grew up with six sisters on there, so you know, getting hand me down some six sisters is not much fun. <laughs> and, uh, but they're all beautiful and, 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 and all my sisters, we all really get on. Um, my dad and mum still alive, dad's 86, mum's 80. Um, they never ever drank or smoked. I um, uh, suppose you know they lived healthy lives and worked hard, so that's probably why they're still here with us. Um, so growing up out there, uh, I was lucky. I had really good elders in my life too. I had um, Sir Doug Nichols. Uh, he was my my dad's brother married his daughter, um, who was you know Uncle Stuart Murray, who started off the Aboriginal f funeral service in in, um, in Victoria. So often. That's the only day I could get off school when it was Uncle Stuart visited in the hearst with a body in the back. <laughs> Dad would say, you can, tomorrow you can go, to, go with Uncle Stuart, he's got a funeral on in Robinvale or something. You know, so I'd sit up in the hearst and rip along the road with Uncle Stuart. So he was great, he, he was my mentor. Um, also lucky that I had a, a, an elder, a lady called Annie Dawn McCartney, who was a sister to Uncle Kevin Coombs. Now, Uncle Kevin Coombs, you know, um, still alive, still with us. So I was lucky when I went down to Melbourne, I, I could ring them people you know, and say, look, I've, Uncle, Uncle Kevin, I'm having this trouble with, with a, you know, a racial issue in the workplace or whatever, and he, he could give me help. So, um, yeah, so I was lucky. So, um, you know, after six years with the legal service and six years uh, you know, with, the, with, the, with the Aboriginal Community Justice Panel, um, I started having dreams and, you know, a lot of stuff that come across our desk was mainly bad, you know, it was pedophilia and, you know, deaths and all that sort of stuff. So um, my wife, Sarah, uh, Sarah also teaches at Melbourne Uni um, in criminology. And she, she witnessed some of my dreams and said, Ron, you've got to get out, um, do the things that you love doing. Um, so yeah, no, now I do, I, I go around and do all the things I love. Um, I came from the cricket today. I played for three minutes at the start of, who was on today? Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Yeah, and, and drove straight from there to here. Um, I did the AFL grand final this year with, with Mike Brady. Um, we did up there Gazali and re-recorded it with a didgeridoo and a 40-piece choir. Um, and now you know, I've, I've been playing a bit with Mike Brady and he's, he's now doing a lot of his Irish stuff. Um, he's written songs about, one about William Buckley. Um, you know, he lived with the Wathurong people for 35 years and you know, Buckley's a nun, that, that, that saying. So there's didge in that. Um, there's a couple of songs with Did You Do on it and he gets my wife Sarah to do his fiddle work 
um, which is great. Yeah, so we, we, we do go around, I do get involved in a lot of musical stuff. Um, but I know what, uh, Michael, you've got me to teach, speak about deep listening. I know Honey Doris spoke a little bit and he did, she did an exercise with you. And when I first learned uh, or heard about this um, uh, gop gopal narwhal, uh, which is a yorta yorta word, um, and about how deep listening fits in, and and I think I think of my childhood, you know, out in that big station called called Yanga. Um, when I was old enough to go with my grandfather, he was there for thirty years on this big station. Then my dad came along, and he spent fifty eight years working for the for the company. Uh, six years ago, uh, that station got sold. Parks and Wildlife bought it, so now it's owned by us, and it's fantastic. It's got you know, 140 kilometres of um, Murrumbidgee River on it and big red gum forests. And, but sitting out there, you know, with my grandfather, uh, he was a, um, a sort of radgery, yorta yorta, born at, um, at Cumra, but, but he was really radgery. And ended up down in Wamba Wamba country, uh, married a, a Wamba Wamba woman. And um, he, sitting around the camp with him, he didn't like talking. I don't know if he didn't like it, but he'd often say, shut up, you know, um, or, or you talk too much. And, and he'd be sitting there with a broken piece of uh, beer bottle, shaving a boomerang. And he did, he wanted to listen to what was going on. You, you, you'd get to one of his camps and he'd go, oh, oh, so-and-so's been here and they've borrowed me shovel. And he knew that just by looking at the tracks. And he knew he'd taken it by the car tracks. And, and now I think back, he was definitely, um, he was definitely doing this deep listening, listening to the wind, and he liked that silence. And I suppose without it knowing it, we all have it as Indigenous people, I, I think. Where does it come from? I reckon, how long have we been here? They're saying 80,000 now, 80,000 years. Now, I've done a video, you know, being brought up at Bell Reynold, um, we've got Mungo at the back, Mungo National Park. And we used to go out there as kids and, um, go down the sand dunes on, a, on bits of tin and, and slide and um, they dated them 57,000 years, Mungo man, Mungo woman. And they recently found footprints out there that are two foot long, two foot long, um, where the sand had blown out from this, where this water hole had been. And even the little kids, they were big feet too. They were 1.5 metres apart, the steps. And in amongst it, there was one right-legged fella. Every three metres, one footprint, every three metres. <laughs> so they go away and, you know, all these jokes started flying around the mission at Barranel, saying, well, if they were running, where were they running from? If they were big feet, big fellas, you know. But what it worked, they worked it out. Um, they were actually all in this little bay chasing fish and they spearing them. Now, they needed somewhere to put the fish that right-legged fella had his left foot in a canoe and he was scooting along. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you start thinking about these things. I don't, I don't know if you guys have ever done this about your, 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 your culture. What would it be like living back then? You had three metre high kangaroos. You had, and emus. You had wombats as big as your car, like a minibus. You had big goannas that were, you know, 30 metres long. You'd have to be listening for everything, I reckon. Every little noise. You know, and, and, and I think that's where it comes from, safety. Where you ride it into our times and we're walking along through the bush and we hear a crack up above. You look up and there's the branch and then you save your friend and you jump out of the way. And you're a hero. Yeah. I, I reckon that's where it's got to have come from. We all do it. We probably, but I think Indigenous people do it without even knowing it. <coughs> Listening to different sounds. And when uh, uh, me and Auntie Doris and Uncle Herb and Lou Bennett and Uncle Herb, the gum leaf player, and oh, there was a couple of non-Aboriginal fellows we took, Steve Zettergreen and Michael Jordan. Steve Zettergreen, one of the best pianists in Victoria jazz. And Michael Jordan, this Irish drummer, amazing. They came with us. We pretty much adopted them and, and, and you know, they just fitted straight in and, oh, who else was there? Honey Doris and, what's that woman, um, guitarist? Anyway, big mobbers went over. And we had to give this lecture 
on um, deep listening. And we all did our studies at um, RMIT Uni, and I, I did my master's there, master's in education. Now, I was a guy that failed third grade. I couldn't read and write, and got kept down. For me to get, and then go and do my master's as an adult, it was, it was a pretty big achievement for me and, and my family as well. But um, going over there, we had to give this lecture that went for an hour and a half with about 12 of us on stage and all professional in their own right. And it was all about, we had to listen to each other and how it worked. Um, it was no order, but, but there was a little bit of order, but we had to sort of fit in. Now, our first lecture uh, got around the Banff Centre, in, in, this is in Canada, and people started ringing in to come. And they said the next day, you, we're, we're gonna have to forget about that venue, because we're gonna have to fit you in the big venue, because there's that many people wanna come and see you. And, and we did, we, we did pull it off, um, but out of that, the Aboriginal unit at the Banff Centre, uh, um, we had the World Indigenous Peoples Conference coming up in Melbourne, um, the one before that was in New Zealand, and in our budget that we went with, we had money left over, we said, let's pay for these guys to come over, there was four of them. Uncle uh, Tom, or Elder Tom, um, he would, would be one of the most amazing men I've ever met, uh, Chief Crane Bear. Then he had three um, people with him, Bo uh, two Bobs uh, and uh, um, Janelle. So they, they came over. Now, here we were uh, at the Rod Laver Arena and Elder Tom wanted to do a smudging, which is like our smoking. And we're all in a circle and he's gonna, gonna smoke us. And all of a sudden this bobcat started up. And I, my an immediate reaction was get angry and go over and tell this bloke, just mate, for the next 10 minutes, switch that bloody thing off, can you? But when he started talking and doing this ceremony, it was like, and I wasn't the only one getting annoyed about this bobcat. We all just turned and it was like we are in a, in a magic circle. It, we couldn't even hear it. And it wasn't until right at the end when he finished that we turned around and noticed the bobcat again. So in a way, um, that was deep listening to me. So that was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, Elder Tom often spoke and he'd had a heart attack and he'd never seen the sea. Um, and it flies over and he's seen it from the, the plane. Then we get to Phillip Island and, and, he's, and he sees it outside the, uh, it was a beautiful calm day. Port Phillip was just like glass. And what a time for him to see it. But he, he said things, one of the most amazing things he said to us was, um, the littlest creature in that stream, the littlest creature, is just as important as that big grizzly bear. You know, and, and when you start thinking about that, what he was meaning, anything that's, that's mucked around in nature, you take anything out of that food cycle or the cycle, it's gonna affect you. And you know, look at us now, um, as in the, the Murray River it was, was drinkable when I was a kid. So anything that's missing out of that river is just important as that big red kangaroo that comes down to drink. Yeah. So just in saying that, before I, I go on, I want you to, um, I want you guys to shut your eyes. Um, yeah, I don't want you to open them until the end. Okay? And I want you to think about um, Anything you wanna. It can be a new baby coming to your family, it could be even someone, you know, passed away. My my brother in law got killed just before Christmas, um, going to work. Um, often I think about him. Um I pro I probably do want to think about uh, I rang an auntie coming up here today. It's a nine year anniversary of her husband dying, Auntie Joy Murphy, who I do a lot of work with and it's today and she's still she still still affects her. <coughs>
Thanks for that. Um, I was with, uh, I know didgeridoo is not part of our, our culture down here, but um, gee, 25 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, I, I first heard a man play it, came to our house and um, uh, he married my first cousin, um, David Gopalil. And when I first heard it, oh, I couldn't believe it, what he could do with it. And I wasn't interested in playing it, I was interested in making them because I, I was good at making um, boomerangs uh, or proper ones after they had the roots that my grandfather showed me. And I wanted to put that into it and I thought, I want to be the best maker. And I went up with Dave to his community and, um, and then out of that I met, uh, through my wife, she used to go up to a community called Yurikala, where that's where the Yothi Yindi come from. And I remember going up there and we ended up living up there for about three months. And every corner I went in that little town, there was an old man playing it up against an old jerry can and little kids sitting around. And uh, so while I was there, I went out with, with this old man called Jalu and he's, he's like the master. <clears throat> and he gave me permission to play it and make it. So, um, and that's how I sort of started off, off making them. But my passion now, uh, I don't teach, I do a few workshops in, in just in communities, you know, when, when uh, and I do one for a week at Geelong Grammar because um, you know they got the money to pay you. Because by the time you get all the materials and it, it works out co it costing a bit of money, but I, I have for over 20 years now taught young men at uh, Malmesbury and Parkville. I was in Parkville on Monday. I don't go into Parkville that much anymore because I'm getting too old and cranky. I think now to because they're so immature there, if you know what I mean. They're, they're under 18s. But the boys at Malmesbury, where I've been going, I do every Friday with them. They're, they're like young men. They, they are, they're ready to get their lives in order or um, they're not as violent. They're, they're pretty violent at Parkville now. So, and, and the security, just to get in there, it takes, it takes you half an hour. The eye, you know, taking photos of your eyes and all sorts of things. Whereas Parkville's pretty... So uh, where Malmesbury is, isn't. But I just finished this one with um, myself. I'll make one with them. See the shape at the bottom? Yeah, yeah. That's what everyone sees. It looks a bit like Australia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when I'm with them, <coughs> I they come in and they're in admissions. And um, so for me, this I, I to get their their attention and that I um I talk about deep listening and respect for elders. Because um, when they come to admissions, I might only have, there'd be two Aboriginals in there, one maybe, and the other 15 are, are non-Aboriginal, and they're, they're coming in for the first six weeks, they've got to stay in there. So often I'll, 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 um, I'll talk about the theory of, of deep listening. And if you can, um, if you can listen and, and not get in any trouble, you'll end up in open units, you'll be able to come into my Didgeridoo workshop. But if you muck up, you end up over in Ullambara, it's a complete lockdown unit. That's where they lock up violent ones and they can't get out for programs. Anybody that goes has to go and see them. So that's my, my, um, my little cherry for them to keep them, make them behave. Um, so I've been going there yeah, yeah, 20 years now and the saddest thing for me, I, I can literally remember at least 16 or 17 young men that are dead now and, and they shouldn't be. That's the sad thing. They shouldn't be dead. We're, you know, having the the setup for these young 
men and young women too. There's nothing for young women. Uh, I had a phone call the other night from a, a community member saying, is there anything for young women like there is for young men? I said, no, there's not. So, sorry to say that. Not that I know of anyway. Um, so if they come into my program, um, it is making um, didgeridoos. Um, and it's for me, I really have to listen to their stories. So here I am, I'm a, you know, a musician and storyteller, but when I get in there, I have to be a good listener. And this young <clears throat> Iraqi boy came in and you listen to their stories and, uh, you know, he, he, he'd seen his uncles get, get uh, murdered and his father. And his mother lands in Melbourne with, you know, seven kids. He ends up on the street and he, I don't, you know, he gets mixed up with the young ones out at Dandenong and um, he, he's a bit naughty he's, and he was he a con artist. Holy and, you know, I've been going there 20 years. He's trying to con me. And, you know, Uncle, can you sign this, uh, sand this for me? You know, sanding's the easiest thing. Get it on the sander. No, you do it. Uncle, you're just trying to con me. And, he, and he'd come up and say, oh, is that good enough, Uncle? No, that's rough, mate. No, I want the rough look. I said, no, you're lazy. <laughs> you're lazy. And then, uh, but as I won him over, you know, the, 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 the thing that we've got in contact with a lot of these different cultures, the uh, Africans and Somalians and... All them is respect for elders. Um, so I say to them, well, your, you know, your grandfather, yeah, he's here. Gee, is he happy with you? No, he's not happy. I said, oh, well, well I wouldn't blame him. How are you going to fix that? How are you going to mend that bridge? But little, little, um, this little fella, um, I remember uh, he, he, his girlfriend was pregnant and um, he... Uh, she had the baby, but it, it was born with the cord around its neck and, and died. So the uh, Royal Women's Hospital rang the centre to get get um, to get him out to go and talk her into letting it go. She was just would not let this baby go, and they did. They, you know, to their credit, they let him out, uh, took him into town, um, and and a week later, um, he came running around the centre with a big smile. Uncle Ron, he said, I've got some family shots, family photos to show you. And I said, yeah, yeah, um, Karim, uh, bring him in. Uh, and he ran back to the unit, he'd come over with this album, and when he sat down, I, I actually wasn't ready for it, I, I didn't know what it was, I thought he was going to show aunts and uncles and that. And the whole album was full of this little baby in a pink, little pink beautiful dress, and I could tell, you know, the lips were blue, and, and from when you, you know, like all of us, when we have kids, you, you really, we really seem to get more sentimental. And I, I thought, I can't cry, you know, I don't, I can't, I've got to be a bit tougher here. Um, so I had to hold it together. And, um, and I got out at the end of the day, and I had to run into, back to Castlemaine, and I was opening up the Castlemaine State Festival, and I had to dress up as an old man. And he was the last full-blood man of the J Jara people, um, and his name was Ewan Up. And Ewan Up, Ewan Up was, uh, he used to wear hobnail boots, a suit and a top hat. And it was a bit annoying to the local government because he used to turn up at all the local functions like the opening of the Denali Bridge and he'd have a piece of mate not, mace night, give me back my land. <laughs> so he's probably one of the, you know, the biggest radicals around. Anyway, they opened up the train line and he ran over to this governor and he, he said to the governor, me not rich in money, but me plenty rich in land. And the governor flicked him, I think it was a shilling or something, and said, don't get drunk on it. Now, I had to act as him that night. And I'm in this old suit. So I thought, oh, no, I'm going to do I'm going to act as my uncle. My uncle Gilbert, he, he's beautiful uncle Gilbert. He passed away about eight years ago in Swan Hill. And he used to walk around Swan Hill and he'd talk to the trees, well, especially in a couple of beers, talk to the trees and argue with them. And, and then he'd, he'd divert all the the traffic into Safeways and all that sort of stuff. He's, the, the police loved Uncle Gilbert. So I pretended I was Uncle Gilbert to do the role. And, and as I'm standing in this suit, we're right out in front of the police station, this police officer runs out and yelled out to me. He said, Ronnie, come over. And I went over and he was an old school friend that's now working there. He said, did you hear about Marty, a, a schoolmate? I said, no. He said, well, I've just been to his funeral. So there, I had that that day, found out about an old friend that died, and did that, and I could feel the walls coming in a bit. You know, we say, 
you're looking out after each other and so for me I definitely know when that's happening um, so for me home in the car and I go back home out back to Barranel out onto that big station and take me fishing line and four days out there I'm better yeah. so we've all got our own ways you know and it could be like only Doris making a quilt or whatever your hobby is um, you really got to make sure you, 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 we do know best, don't we? We know when we're, walls are coming in, and you know, you start arguing with the with your partner or whatever. Um, so if no one else is picking up, you've got to pick it up too. So um, that that works for me. And um, get a smoked as much as I can. Um, I know often I go into other people's country or go home. I'll, I'll light a fire and smoke myself, or go to somewhere where I know it's going to be a, a smoking. Um, and that, that often works works for me too, um, yeah. But um, deep listening, where else does it come in? For me, um, definitely goes back to my beautiful old nan. And I was talking to, about my nan in in uh, Parkville to these young to these young um, offenders, and Uncle Jim Berg was there, and and Uncle Jim Berg. Uh, He's a pretty tough old elder to, 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 you know, like, you know, an upset Uncle Jim, put it that way, which I did once. I, I, I learned from that. Um, <laughs> but he loves me now. And when I spoke about my nan, and I said, if my nan was around now, she couldn't read or write. She was a matriarch of my family. She bought 13 kids in a, uh, in a horse and cart from South Australia all the way through Victoria to... Swan L, so the welfare didn't grab him. Travelled at night, did those amazing things. And she was only a little tiny lady. And Nan was a brilliant cook. You know, she was cooked at a lot of the pubs around Swan Hill. Um, and she had big Coke bottle glasses. And even when she spoke to my mum and Auntie Letty and Auntie Betty, they jumped. So imagine what us kids were like. And when she got angry, her eyes looked twice as big, you know. <laughs> so... When we sat down at the end of the night, Nan sat down in a beautiful flower dress she used to, and she sat there and crossed her legs. All us kids sat in a circle, and the story started. And I sat there, and I put my arm around. I used to hang on to one of them four spare tyres <laughs> there, and away she'd go telling stories. And the reason why I did sit there is because the last story of the night was always scary. And it's pretty much the same story. But you knew it was coming, and she had this th way of going, um, and she'd stop the story about, you know, she'd look around, look at the windows, come a little bit closer. And the kids would come in, come in, come in, and away the story would go again, you know, about this, uh, the hairy man in the river, and stop and look at it, and <laughs> come a bit closer. You know, after about eight of these come a bit closer, and she, get, and she gets you that tight, and then she'd go, boo! You know, and we'd all roll backwards and laugh. You knew it was coming. Yeah. So I, I did know, um, when I, whenever I do tell some of her little stories that she told, beautiful stories, I can smell her. Honestly, I can smell her. The little one about a little snake she used to tell, and uh, how it lived in this hollow log. But, um, yeah, she was amazing. So... Um, my dad's totem um, is the red-tailed black cocky. Wirren, the red-tailed black cocky. Now my mum's is a woolly wagtail. So you know when I take and drop my beautiful thirteen-year-old son, that you know I've, I've spent a lot of time with him over the years and taken him camping and you know we, we hang out a lot and uh, we drive into this amazing school. It's like drive, driving to the Harry Potter muse, movie, you know, where they, the broom goes through. That's what the building's like. It's massive. He's in with Clive Palmer's son. You know, he's got the third richest kid in Asia in his. You know, it's, it's pretty privileged. And there's little Willy Wagtail right at the entrance. And I said, "You're right here, son. There's Nan." So Nan's Richie Rook, and you doing him mucking up? She's there watching you. Yeah. But anyway, so Mum, the Willy Wagtail married my dad, um, red tail black cocky. Uh, endangered and look at the colours yellow, red and black same colours as the Aboriginal flag yeah. um, 
I'm going to tell you a story about um, when you we look at Victoria uh, after we say Bunjil, you know, Bunjil the Creator. Um, if we really think about that creation, you know, he only made one emu. He, he didn't get it right first go. One big emu, Chingle, lived out near Horsham, and he he got so jealous, or she did, got jealous of her egg, or um, and tore everything. She ended up a cannibal because she tore up other animals that went near it. And, um, Wow, the crow nearly got caught by her and ran into the Grampians and then the emu kicked the, the mountains and made razors gap, Victoria Gap. Long story, but anyway, that's, that's Bunjil. But I'm going to tell you this story about the army. Because I grew up on the, even though I'm Wamba Wamba, I grew up in Uncle Kutch's, Kutch Edwards' country, Barrannell, Muddy Muddy, Mungo. And they believed in a spirit called the army. So I grew up listening to Biami stories as well. So I'm, I'm right on the edge. Now Biami, he created the he created the country, but he only put the sky about this high off the ground. So underneath it was all, all the people and the animals and, and they were so small they were the size of you know, ants pretty much. So you know when people were walking along and oh I've got to pick that little splinter and the little oh little splinter's crying. Oh sorry little echidna and he put the little kidna down, off he went. So that's how tiny things were. Now, Biami created this pool of water that was um, like healing, healing pool, um, like a magical pool, really. And after a couple of years of being up there, he came down and he started walking around. All the animals got excited, saying, oh, Biami's here. So they all was a big crowd around him, and he came across that pool that he actually forgot he made. So he, he knelt down and he took a, a drink of it and the water, when it got inside him, it made him feel like powerful. And he thought, oh, I need to swim in it. So he dived in. And while he was in there, as he come up, he drank more water and he became stronger and stronger. So this time he had a, a digging stick in, on his lap lap and he pulled the digging stick out and he went underwater and as he come up, he looked at all the animals looking at him, he said, we need more room to grow. And he pushed the sky and he pushed it and with his power he pushed it right up to where it is now. And the sun started to shine down and the water that was dripping down off his arm, the sun evaporated up and it went up and became the clouds. And for the first time ever, rain fell on the country. And all the cracks and all the crevices and water and the holes all fill up with water and all the rivers started to flow and they flowed into one big pond that became the ocean. Now after that all the birds were happy and some of the birds flew up into the sky. Some birds couldn't fly. Some birds had beautiful voices and beautiful colours but the old bush turkey he just had that horrible old croak and it was brown and he got jealous so he ran into the forest he said I'll fix these fellas he got out his his fire sticks and quickly lit a fire and lit the whole forest and the whole country got on fire and the next minute there was chaos now all the birds that were flying around started to panic and they looked for safety and some of them flew out of the sky and flew straight into the ocean where their feathers became the scales and their wings became the fins and they became fish now stop the story there, otherwise you're going to be here for an hour and a half. Because <laughs> it all goes back to the turkey. And, oh, he, and he ends up getting his head burnt and all sorts of stuff. But you get the gist of the creation. So at that time, you remember, there was, um, he didn't make the kangaroo like he is now. The kangaroo actually crawled. Crawled around like that. So he was so slow. And his tail, remember his big tail sticking up? He was flopping this side and flopping that side. He wasn't the fastest animal, he was the slowest animal. People made fun of him. And we'll call him Burra. So Burra was, was slow. Now one night, Burra was out in the dark on the plains of New South Wales, just out the back of Barrannell. And he, he was crawling and he was eating grass and then he could smell, smell the fire of two-legged men. He pulled himself up on a tree and he looked into the distance and he could see the flames, the flickering flames of the fire. 
he became curious. He let himself down and he started to sneak stealthily through the grass and through the bushes and he creeped right up on them people. Now he creeped so close that he could see a circle of fire. He could see the whites of their eyes. He could hear some music. He creeped closer and closer. When he got so close, he tucked his back legs up underneath him and he leaned, he leaned his chin over his paws and he listened. Now all the women, they were sitting around. They were sitting around on logs and they had their possum skin rugs rolled up in between their legs and they were beating time on their rugs. And the men were inside the circle of fire and they had leaves, gum leaves, strapped to their ankles and their wrists and they were dancing around into the time, into, into the beat of the drums and the women playing. And there Burrow stayed, watching. Now without it knowing it, Burrow became excited. The faster the women played the drums, the faster the blood ran through his veins. His whiskers began to twitch. The hairs on the back of his neck started to stand up and his heartbeat started to run with the beat of the women playing the drums. Without even knowing it, Burrow jumped to his feet and with a howl, he jumped through the circle of fire and he joined in, in the dance behind the men crawling on all fours. Now the women, they screamed, half in fear, half in admiration, but they didn't stop beating time on their possum skin drums. Now the men looked around and they spotted Burrow and they started laughing and clapping their hands and falling about on their backs and making fun of Burrow. When all of a sudden, Burrow found himself all alone, dancing around the fire. And all of a sudden, this old grey-headed man, he thought it'd be funny and hilarious. He jumped to his feet, he ran over and grabbed a possum skin and he rolled it into a bundle and he tucked it into the back of his lap lap. And he ran out behind Burra and he started to dance and copy Burra around and around the fire. Now Burra needed a better look. He looked back and he stood up on his back legs and he balanced on his tail and put his paws up underneath him and he started to hop and hop and hop and hop and hop around that fire and that old man hopped behind him. Then all the other men thought, yeah, why don't we do the same? They all ran and got possum skin bundles and rolled them up and they started to dance behind Burra hopping around and around that fire. They danced all night like that. Now, when the morning chill air, Burra, he went over and he joined him with the women. And the women loved him. They were saying, Burra, what a beautiful job. And they were patting him and feeling how soft his fur was. When all the men met, the old man, he spoke first and he said, Burra should be put to death. He has seen a sacred ceremony, a ceremony that only men and women should see. And another young man spoke up. No, no, old man, he said. It's not a, this is not a day for punishing. It should be a day for rewarding. Burra has taught us a new dance. The debate went on. When Burra looked up, he spotted all the men walking towards him. The old grey-headed man was the first one. He grabbed him by one arm, another by another. And another young man grabbed him by the tail. And they took Burra off out into the bush. There they held him down on his back and with a sharp pointed stick for a punch and a rock for a mallet, they put it onto his front right tooth and knocked it out. In the same ritual as when a young boy becomes a man. And they said to Burra, we will take you as our totem from this day on. And you can hop, you can crawl, you can walk or jump however you please. They let Burrow up and the last time they seen him he was hopping back to the plains of New South Wales. And that was the first ever time a kangaroo dance had been performed. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, and talking on that, I, I did bring 
uh, Ron, maybe on this possum skin gathering you're going to do. This is not possum. This is, um, oh, these, these two are possum. Uh, this is kangaroo. And this was found in my grandfather's shed in a trunk. And Aunty Lady reckoned it must have been there for 30 years because his shed was, uh, as we were cleaning it, there was snakes going everywhere and going and running out. He was a bit of a hoarder, you know, you just get things and chuck them in. So there was old cars and carts and everything in there. But in this old tin trunk, there was two rugs. There was one really nice one. Uh, and, and, and my cousin grabbed it straight away. <laughs> and he gave me, and I was a little bit peeved off for a while, actually. How come he gets a good one? I've cleaned up more than him. You know, he arrived late. But <laughs> I got this one. And in the end, it worked out that I did get the best one. It's 100 years old. Only let he re-stitched it, and you can see the spear marks in it. There, yeah, a couple all over. Yeah, and I parked some wildlife, when I told them about it, they said, can we take it? And I said, yeah, well, don't go cutting it up or anything. I said, no, no, we just want to take it and study it. And they had it for a couple of weeks, and they come back, and what they said just blew me away. They said that that one there is extinct. And another one, which is this one, I think it's that one, um, is the yellow-footed rock wallaby, which is highly endangered, which I did see uh, last year. I went to South Australia and is in, the, in this uh, park called Wilpena Pound. And while the, gu the guide was taking us, I said, yeah, I've got one in, I've got, a, I, I, I got a, one on a rug. He was looking at me real serious. I said, no, it's old. I said, I didn't kill it. <laughs> you know, he's thinking that I killed it and put it on a rug. I said, no, no, it's, it's an old rug. Um, yeah, I can't, that, that one is a rock wallaby. Um, and I have seen footage, uh, the museum have got it. He's only about, oh, it'd be that high, but a real fat head, a little short fat tail. And under, they said under his feet were like sand shoes. And, and the, the footage is all, all, you know, not real good, but you see him jumping up through the rocks real quick. And that's why he has that, that stuff on his feet. So I just thought I'd bring that in and show you um but um yeah often you know if i if i do a, a, a some sometimes i often say you know do um cults awareness trainings to different companies i used to do a lot of it but not so much now I'd, i might do one every couple of months or something um but i'm not you know showing people and say yeah and we had these and um you know, these ones are actually warm and the men wore hunter pants and with them and you know <laughs> We, we invented a certain type of underpants, you know. <laughs> yeah, we, we should have put a we should have put a patent on that, you know. No. Uh, but no, I, I often say, you know, we don't get, you know, recognised for some of our stuff we do. Um, like you know, David and I have been inventing the shears. Often people don't know an Aboriginal man did that, um, so we do need to be recognised for like, like that underpants. You know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I think that's. I don't want to keep you here all night, but um, yeah, again, thanks for ha having me. And um, but is there any any questions? Like, why is it? Yeah, any? Did you make the noise? Oh, now we call it wangan, but but it comes from one, which one is the boomerang in our language. You know, the way one gun, one is a boomerang, and that's really a blade of a boomerang. And you know, why does it make? We used to make them out of wooden rulers. Well, wood. Yeah, that's the other thing. Why does it make noise sometimes and others? I, I can't, to tell you the truth. Why doesn't it go all the time? When you, when you think, um, when Nan swung it, it was, it was dinner time, but certainly um, she spoke about it as being used, you know, if, if you heard it in the middle of the day when you shouldn't hear it, you've got to run back to the camp. Um, some did it for you know different ceremonies. You know everyone did, but why does it go in and out? Yeah, and Nan Nan was saying you could actually put babies to sleep with it by hanging on to it. And you, you do when you think that do it soft. It is like a, a, a you can imagine it putting a child to sleep. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, and what do the, what do um, white people name it? Anyone guess? 
a bull roarer. <laughs> How do you get a bull out of that? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, bull roarer. Um, didgeridoo, you know. Um, didgeridoo for a... Um, someone told me the, the other day, didgeridoo is um, actually uh, means, what are you doing? It's a didgeridoo, it's a dance. So that's the first time I heard that. But um, it's a trivia question. Is didgeridoo an Aboriginal word? Um, you've got to say no. Um, but yiddiki is what they call it, Yurikala, where I, where I learned it from. Um, but certainly, we, you know, a lot of Victorians have adopted it. You so often see it at funerals. Um, yeah, I played it f over a year. I do a lot of funerals too. Um, not just Aboriginal, by the way. I played it a lot of, uh, who was that? Know, Ted Bailey, his wife, his sister died and I played at her funeral. She, she just wanted it. Um, the saddest one I, I ever played at was at home in Barrannal. We had a, my schoolmate, one of my school friends, Stephanie, in my class, um, got killed in that Krang train disaster with her two little girls beside her. That was certainly sad. And her brother got killed by a truck when he was seven. So her dad, he's amazing. He, he, he's uh, for you know, a non-Aboriginal fella, in the 1967 referendum, he went around in a car with a big speaker on the top, encouraging people to vote yes. Um, so the Aboriginal people in town class him as an Aboriginal. Um, when his daughter died, he, he spends all his time up the cemetery now. The, he, he's he's um, surveyed where all the Aboriginals are buried. He's cleaned it all up. It's like, it's immaculate. Very, yeah, but he can spend time with his kids. Sad, but... It's his life now, um, Mr. Blake. Yeah. But yeah, any any uh, questions? Here? I just wanted to say um, thanks and oh, no worries. Everything that you said, I know we're related now. Yeah. Because <laughs> when you talk about Yanga, yeah. and I've heard up the butcher, yeah. talk about Yanga Don, Yanga Mati Mati. Yeah, yeah. And then when you talk about Barano, Mum born at Barano, and we talk about the the um the the, the herd. Yeah. Nana told the story that her father also drove the hearse. Hearse, you hear a few? So, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. family tree, and I'm like, so that's, oh. I know we're related. <coughs> those stories. Yeah, yeah. Told, and now you're telling them, and it was just like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's another part yeah. of deep listening that it is, isn't it? We just know, when we're looking at one another, and yeah. it's either out of our features, or it's the same stories that we've yeah. been told, we haven't. Mm. Yeah, even if we haven't met, we know. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, really it's like, you know, Kutcher's dad. Uh, Kutcher's dad and my dad were best mates. He'd call into our place on a Saturday morning religiously. With the, he had a Hessian bag and you knew there was chocolates in there. Um, and it, it, like, you imagine Uncle Kutcher was six foot six. My dad's smaller than me. <laughs> and dad was a gun boxer. And Uncle Kutcher's, um, or Uncle Nugget, funny name, uh, Nugget Edwards. Uh, he was dad's second in the ring. And, um, and th they actually travel with a circus for two years. And so I, I can relay these, when, as my dad's getting old, he's saying, he's only, I wake up at night, son, I think of old things. And so he tells me stories about Uncle Nugget. And so I relay them back to Kutcher. So again, again, it's a way of sort of deep <coughs> listening, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, Honey Mary. Oh, yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just amazing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for, um, I've no. never heard that. Yeah. That comes from where my mother's born. Yeah. Oh, well, you're welcome. It's nice because, you know, I, I um, often, Uncle Al, when he was alive, he, he um, gave me permission to tell the story about the rock down here. You know, does anyone know the story? A legend rock? That's a beautiful story because it teaches kids. It all happened about um, the tribe not sharing their fish, a great haul of fish with their dingoes and that magic dingo. And um, it, 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 it's about sharing. You know, it's a great story to tell kids. You don't share, you know, that's what'll happen to you. You know, you turn into that rock. Or, yeah, so it's, our stories do have you know, a, a lot of um, meanings and sometimes five different meanings, that's what I find. Um, yeah, I love. Um, I, was, I was saying to Annie Doris last time. We, you know, in that story, we should add. Some, I don't believe stories should stand still, neither, because I've heard my mother's creation story from South Australia, told by three different elders, and 
the same storyline, but all told different. Why can't we add more in or, and I was saying to Auntie Doss, which he said, why don't you do a quilt up and we, we add more into the story about the, the magic dingo. All it says is there's one dingo and then there's magic. Why don't we talk, add a chapter in about what he actually did with his magic. Right, you know, he did turn the tribe into a, but add a little bit in, yeah. I, I don't think stories, and, and I'm sure they didn't, because we traded stories, um, uh, stories evolve, um, yarns evolve, yeah, I reckon. Yeah, well, why, why do we, our dream time stories have to stop? We've got storytellers now. Um, like our, our, my red tail cockatoo one, I've got a beautiful story about it, um, how he got his red tail, and in the same stories, how the black duck got his neck stretched to, and it became the red, the, the, the red beaked black swan. Um, but that's, that story's from Fraser Island, you know, and, and it's a bachelor people, bachelor, yeah, bachelor people own that story. Yeah, so they, the old man gave me permission to tell it, but as long as you, every time you tell it, you acknowledge us. And we know that, that's our law. Um, I, I've been telling one about a, a did you do play, because you don't often hear, I found it in an old book, and you know, you see a lot of books that have been written by non-Aboriginals, don't quote the tribe that own it. Now, um, in, in that story, it's, uh, the, the did you do player ends up, um, he becomes a possum, and the other, fella, he come, becomes a little sea crab that dances along the ocean. But there's no, where does it come from? So, but it, be, be, it will be easy in a way because I've got to look across the top of Australia to what tribe used Ruru for crab and Paray for possum and I'll be able to find it. And I'll be able to then ask the people, do you mind me telling this story? And I found it in an old book with no Reader's Digest, I think, an old Reader's Digest. <laughs> yeah, they used to do switch story books, you know, and, and it, yeah. But no, thanks. Have, have a safe journey home. And Janet, um, but great to catch up with you. You said you were going to go and you stayed. But it's nice, um, Janet. Um, and, and I do um, keep up your good work, guys. And, but watch that burnout factor, you know. Know when to take a holiday. I know it's hard, but... Um, you don't want to end up under there where you can't do any work. Yeah, yeah. Frank's fine. Oh. Thank you, Rob. No worries. Yeah, thank you.